Boys and girls, will you come forward, please? Good to see everyone this morning. Today, I want to talk with you about praying. Do any of you ever pray? Raise your hand if you pray. If you're in church, you, you can raise your hand because we pray in church, right? In your bulletin today, it tells the Bible story that I just read about how Jesus taught his friends to pray. He said several things. One thing he did was to teach them the Lord's Prayer, which we are going to all pray together later on. Now, in different places in the Bible, the Lord's Prayer is a little bit different. Some churches say it different from the way we say it. But the important thing is that Jesus gave it to us so that if we didn't know anything about praying, we could just pray that prayer and know that God would hear us. That was the other thing he said. God always hears and answers our prayers. When we get afraid, when it's dark and there's spooky things in the closet, and we pray to Jesus to be near, Jesus is near, and we get confidence and we feel safe. And we're okay. Sometimes Jesus comes to us as a parent and assures us that everything is okay. I'm glad to know that you are praying because prayer is important. Jesus said every prayer will be answered. So when you need help, are you worried about school? Are you worried about your mom and daddy or your brother that keeps bothering you? Say a prayer for them. And you will be surprised things will happen. Now let's pray together and you repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for teaching us how to pray. Thank you for listening to our prayers. Thank you for loving us. that you answer our prayers. Amen. Y'all keep on praying. You can go and pray somewhere else. We're debating whether or not we want to go to church or not. It's not the only one. Well, let me ask you, how long should a sermon be? <laughs> yeah, I hear short. Well, how, how, how long is long enough? Till I get finished. That's dangerous. Well, I want to talk to you about today because it is the biggest complaint that I have heard about preachers. Either they can't preach or they preach too long. And I think we need to address that issue because 
In the Presbyterian Church, preaching is a central part of worship. I've heard many of folks complain about some preacher at the church down the street that they left about how he preached too long, 30, 40, just too long. Well, how long should a sermon be? I've heard some of your suggestions. <laughs> Given at the door. Well, you might be thinking to yourself, just get on with what you got to say and I will tell you when to stop. I guess most of us think about the length of sermons the way the rather sexist old law went that described the length of women's dresses. It said, dresses should be long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to keep it interesting. When I arrived at my first church in McLeansville after going to seminary, I was standing on the porch one day at the end of the service and this old elder with a cane came out and he said, good sermon. In fact, it was two and maybe three good sermons. <laughs> I said, did I preach too long? He said, well, let's just say that you missed two or three good stopping points. <laughs> I'll never forget him and never forget the advice that he gave me that day. I've got a friend named Vicki Jones Johnson of Winston-Salem. She's a former pastor of ours when we lived down in Moore County and is now a cohort in ministry. After she left our church, she was called by God to go down to the beach to pastor Calabash Presbyterian Church. It's a small church with about 75 worshipers on a winter morning, but on a summer morning, they move their services down on the beach and they will have more than 500 people show up for worship. She told me her first summer there, a summer there, she figured out that people on vacation really don't have the time to travel with you about the length of a worship service. And she caught on pretty quickly that they didn't come down to the beach to listen to a 45-minute lecture on the Bible. They would even tell her about past beach trips when visiting pastors were preaching out on the beach and how long their sermons were, 45 minutes or more, and she took it all to heart. And she decided to be careful with the length of her sermons. What had started her thinking about that on her first Sunday, on a winter in a winter, she went in to get her robe out of the robing closet in the pastor's office. And she turned the light on and she noticed up on the wall above the, the hat, the coat rack, was a print that was framed and hung right under the overhead light. And the print read, To the Preacher, the Gettysburg Address is one of the greatest speeches ever given. It can easily fit on one sheet of paper. Jesus' great stories of the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son take only a few short paragraphs. If Abraham Lincoln and Jesus Christ can convey such depths and truth in so few words, surely you can too. 
for God's sake and ours too, keep it short. <laughs> well, Vicky took the sign, uh, the sign to heart and probably changed the length of her sermons because when she was at our church, she tended to run on a little bit. But it's always difficult to decide when to earn, earn, end a sermon. It's always, they say it's always better to leave a party while you're still having fun. But when should a sermon end and how should it end? Sometimes too short a sermon sound kind of superficial and simplistic and a few points are thrown out there. None of them developed very well, and all of a sudden things end. But some sermons run on too long. The preacher attempts to do too much in the sermon, tackles too many subjects, includes too many ideas, and more illustrations than are really needed. And the congregation gets overwhelmed. You know, there was a day when people listened to long addresses as a form of public entertainment. But today, most of us never hear a speech longer than a quarter of an hour. We're con sort of conditioned to pay attention until the next TV commercial. <coughs> if we preach to you over 20 minutes, we run the risk that you will mentally turn off, tune out, take a nap, or at least be thinking about vacation that's coming up. The Catholic Church sermons or homilies tend to be at least about 10 minutes. But as I said, the preaching of the word is an integral part of Presbyterian worship, so our sermons tend to be longer than 10 minutes. When I arrived at a transitional, at, as a transitional minister at, at the Hallfields Church in Mevin, a kind elder came up after the first service to inform me that one of the people in the church had repaired the clock that was hanging right on the back wall. <laughs> and he went on to explain that they had invested in fixing this old clock because they like to get out of church before noon so that they can go down the street to the restaurants and not have to stand in line. Well, like Vicky. I took his hints and uh, rethought my sermons while I was there. But it's always hard to end a sermon. You take Jesus, for instance. Jesus is known for his parables that are very short. And they're pithy stories through which he so well conveys a great truth. Jesus' parables are noted for their vivid and everyday detail. They're also noted for the lack of endings. Think about it. The prodigal son ends with the wayward son back in the father's house, but we are not told whether things were happy ever after. It could be that that old boy, after a good meal and the party, hit the road again. In the story of the Good Samaritan, we don't know if the afflicted man ever recovered for his wounds, from his wounds, or if the Good Samaritan kept his promise to the innkeeper to pay all the man's medical bills, or even if they had any other relationship or maybe became friends after that. Jesus simply ends the story abruptly and without a full conclusion. I wonder why sometimes when you're telling a story, you, you set up the problem, some human dilemma, some crisis that's begging for resolution, but then you just can't quite figure out how to end it. I've gone to many of a movie that was full of good action and human drama and interest, 
But when it came time for the movie to end, it just sort of dribbled off into nothingness, as if the producers couldn't think of a good ending. Is that Jesus' problem with the ending of parables? I, I doubt it. Some of you are old enough, and I certainly am, <clears throat> to remember going on Saturday morning to the local movie theater for kids' movies, and a lot of times they were series. I used to go to the Wade Sonian Theater in our little Alabama, Alabama town on Saturday morning while Mother and Daddy went shopping, and usually the movies were about cowboys like the Cisco Kid and Hopalong Cassidy, and my favorite, Presbyterian Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. And every once in a while, just right in the middle of a big shootout scene, just as the hero's fate was in doubt, the words, to be continued, flashes across the scene. And all of us kids would let out a collective groan because you had to come back next Saturday if you wanted to know how the story ended. And of course, it wouldn't end. There was always to be continued on the last frame of the movie to get you back next week. Maybe that's why it's hard to end a sermon. The preacher is afraid if the sermon ends uh, neatly that maybe you won't come back next week. Sometimes it's hard to finish a sermon because there's always more that you can say. A preacher doesn't want to prematurely cut off thought on the subject, and the subject of sermons is God. We don't want to end the subject while God is still going on. Despite our infidelity and our waywardness, God continues to love us continues to hear our prayers, continues to speak to us, continues to reach out into our lives and make a difference, keeps responding to our needs. In today's gospel reading, Jesus is teaching the disciples to pray. He says that when you pray, you should be very persistent. You should keep on asking for God's intervention in your lives because God loves us and reaches out to us in return. We discover that our prayers are answered and all of a sudden we experience a blessing. When we worship together on Sunday morning, we believe that God is here right here with us, listening, responding in love for us, and even calling us of all people to service in God's name. When we go out of worship, God does not leave us. God goes with us in our everyday walk of life, continues to stay there, empowering us to face the challenges and the joys ahead. Our experience of God doesn't end with a sermon. It could be, though, the beginning of experiencing God. When I end a sermon, it's time for you to begin. To begin your questions, your complaints, your observations, your responses, your service, your obligations. I don't think sermons end until God says they're over. Sometimes the very best Sunday sermons are those that don't really come to completion until sometime on end of the week on Wednesday afternoon when you are confronted with an opportunity to respond in faith to your circumstances. 
and you discover that the Sunday service begins to be enacted by you in your place, in your circumstance. That's why we preachers are attempted to keep qualifying and to continue to say one more thing and to give some more helpful illustrations that might help you figure out how to engage and connect in your discipleship. It's not my job to tie up all the loose ends in our finish of a sermon. It's your baptismal assigned job. So, when the sermon ends, I will not stop what I'm talking about. When the worship ends, that is not the end of the sermon. No, the sermon, your sermon, is over with when God says it's over. So, be prepared to go out of here and continue this sermon. Let us pray. Lord, you know us. We are trying to be faithful. We're trying to do the right thing. But sometimes our performance doesn't always live up to our or your expectations because we lose heart. We fall away. We get tired of asking for your help. We have difficulty keeping our discipleship faithful. But Lord, we know your nature is to forgive. And your love for us is always constant. Teach us to pray without ceasing for the strength we need to serve you faithfully. And thank you for listening to our prayers. Amen.